Guys, how are you? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and this is the monthly Serial at Midnight Spotlight on Kino Lorber, in which I spotlight every new release from Kino Lorber and their partner labels. Here's the catch. So as I'm recording this video, this has really just arrived, and I was in the process of uh, taking the shrink wrap off everything. I made it through like four titles, and I was like, you know what I should do? I should just fire up the camera and let's all discover this stuff together at the same time. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to put this on the floor and we're going to talk about these uh, together. I haven't really, like it's, I know some of this stuff, you know, I, I knew it was coming, but haven't watched any of it. And like I said, it's still in the shrink wrap. So we'll like, you're in on the process, right? So huge thanks to Kino Lorber for doing this. Thanks to you guys. Let's jump right into it. So if you saw my February coverage, it was missing a full titles that had not arrived yet. So they're here now. They are uh, The Man in the Basement, which is a Greenwich title. And uh, let's see, this is a, where was this from? Is this a, I was looking for the language and I can't find it easily. All right, well, here it is here. I'm gonna freeze it, read it. All right, uh, this one's really interesting to me. Silent Avant-Garde. This is a collection of um, 21 experiments with silent film and new music, including work by Marcel Duchamp, Man Ray, Orson Welles, Orson Welles Mary Ellen Butte, and many more. Uh, these are restored in 5K. It's a Blu-ray, so you're not seeing it in 5K, but they're restored in 5K. And uh, I am really interested in, you know, checking these out. As I say, like if you've, a lot of you guys have been with me as I do these Kino Lorber videos for months now, maybe even years. Um, the exploration of the past is so interesting to me because you realize like, oh no, we're the same. It's been a hundred years. We didn't change. Like we just keep doing a lot of the same things over and over. The people are the same. The motivations, our art, like so much of it is just the same. We're in this cycle. Um, I mean, I think like technology changes and things like that, but you watch some of these pre-codes and you know, the drug use and like the, the stuff, it's like, uh, this feels like right now. Uh, Arsene Lupin connects, uh, there's a connection to the Lupin anime series, right? For all the Lupin people out there, cause he's, he's Lupin the third, right? So anyway, uh, this is um, four movies, one, two, yeah, four movies uh, of the, and this is one of the great, uh, one of the great sort of mystery characters in the, European tradition uh, and the city's movie. What are the years on this? 1957, 1959, 1962. I'm sorry. It's three movies. Um, French with English subtitles. It does not look like there's any features here. Let's see if there's reversible. No. No. Is it reversible? No. And the last thing from February that we haven't talked about that is now here is season three of Migre, 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 Migre. So this is the three of four seasons, I believe it's four, a four season show from the BBC. Didn't they pronounce it Migret? I think that's how they pronounced it in the UK at the time, which is not right, but you know. Um, so this is uh, really cool because these show, I mean, this is really, this is great. Like what a, what an eclectic era we're entering into with our collection. Like we've got all the hits. I was talking to Bree the other day and I was like, you know, if it all just ended tomorrow, I was like, I've got everything I ever wanted in some format. And now it's just like gravy. Now it's just like experimenting and just checking out cool new things and, and learning about things that I never even knew existed like this. Like I never saw this show before. This was a, a show that aired in the UK. I don't even know if it ever aired in the U S uh, people will let me know. But, uh, so this is, so that's it. That's season three. All right. And now we begin the March, 2023, uh, hall where I'm just going to grab a handful guys. I'm just going to grab a handful. So these are going to be in no particular order. Jeffrey Hunter. No man is an Island. Uh, I am really interested in Jeffrey Hunter. Um, the original, Captain Pike from Star Trek, uh, Jesus, uh, the searcher. I love Jeffrey Hunter. Um, and this is, uh, who is this directed by? This is, let's see. I don't see a oh, written, directed and produced by John Monks Jr. And Richard Goldstone. We got audio commentary by Steve Mitchell, uh, combat films, American realism author, Steve J. Stephen J. Rubin. 
Oh, that's all one. That's all one line. It's uh, the commentary by those by by those people. Uh, really cool. Universal 1962. <laughs> this is gonna be a lot of fun. I've never seen this. Double crossbones. Donald O'Connor. Make him laugh from Singing in the Rain. If if you've seen Singing in the Rain, you know like make him and make him laugh is like forever etched in your memory because you've never like that's one of the craziest. He's like running up the wall and doing flips and stuff. If you've never seen Singing in the Rain, guys, go watch Singing in the Rain. Beautiful new 4K edition of that from uh, from Warner Brothers. Anyway, this is Double Crossbones from 1951. Um, Universal, I'm guessing, yeah, because he was at Universal. Francis the Talking Mule was going to be, you know, that, those, those were, that was a 50s series. I guess he was contracted at Universal maybe at that time. I shouldn't talk. This is, uh, it, this is just off the cuff. Somebody's going to be like, he was also, he was not contracted. He was also playing at Paramount. And audio commentary by Lee Gambin. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and film historian Gary Frank. I'm got a, a really interested to see what Lee Gambin has to say about this movie. Um he stars as a bumbling shop, uh, shopkeeper's apprentice who finds his true calling on the South Seas and the comedy adventure Double Crossbones. I love me a pirate comedy. I mean, I love a good pirate movie, but I like a pirate comedy too. This is interesting. Making Mr. Right, uh, Malkovich in a lighthearted role because, you know, nothing says lighthearted like Malkovich, right? So um, John Malkovich, uh, Anne Magnuson. Let me see. You know, I don't have, I don't have a knife. To uh to open these up, let me because we want to see right. Some of the, not a lot of these have um, slip covers, but we do want to know if it has alternate cover artwork beneath. So it does not. It was all for naught. But uh, this movie has a what is this? 1987. Um, <laughs> read the paper. Read the paper jacks book. It says. Directed by Susan Seidelman. Uh, audio commentary by producer director Susan Seidelman and actress Anne Mag Magnuson. Uh, Modern Love, interview with actress Anne Magnuson. Pygmalion 87. Oh, interview with producer, director Susan Seidelman. Secret Admirer. This is a um, uh, a, a movie. It's, it's Kelly Preston. Let's see. Kelly Preston, C. Thomas Howell, Lori Laughlin, Fred Ward. I've got a uh, the Olive version of this. You know, Olive put out a lot of movies. I don't think they're in great shape now. And if you've noticed... I think I can say this because nobody's told me this. This is just what I have observed. Uh, a lot of Olive releases, their license has expired on those releases and Kino Lorber has picked them up. And you know, Frank Tarzi used to work at Olive. So he's bringing them to Kino Lorber, That's, which is really interesting. But this is one that I have from Olive and it has this kind of provocative, it's Kelly Preston going like, like really close on the cover, like pursing her lips. And my wife saw it. She was like, what is this? And I was like, it's a comedy. It's not what it looks like. This is a more family friendly. Maybe the alternate artwork is, is on this one. It is. This is what I'm talking about. I would got to flip this around. Um, very cool. What are the special features here? This has uh, audio commentary by director David Greenwald, co-writer Jeff Koff, and associate producer Lynn Koff, moderated by Daniel Kramer. Uh, theatrical and TV, theatrical trailer and, TV, and uh, a radio spots, not TV spots. 1985. It's a really fun movie, um, and I'm glad that more people are going to discover it now because it's like back in print and affordable too. That's another thing is like a lot of Olive releases are uh, a little on the pricey side, and you know these are going to be like 20 bucks or less most of the time so if you get them during a sale. Like it's the time to go. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille's The Crusades. Is this pre-code? 1930? Oh, it's not. 1935. Um, Loretta Young, Henry Wilcox, Wilcoxon. Let's see. Uh, is this over two hours? Yes. Cecil B. DeMille, why can't you make movies that are under two hours? He was one of those guys that was like, it's a spectacle. It's a majestic. It's art. You know, he, was, he made these huge movies. And... Uh, a lot of them are, Cecil B. the Mill was like a master of exploitation cinema, but he dressed up these Bible stories or like history stories and they have all this like sex and violence in them, but he's like, it's the Bible or it's history. He knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, com oh, audio commentary by Alan Arkish and film historian, Dan uh, filmmaker Daniel Kramer. That's fantastic. Did I show you the back? There we go. Uh, oh, I see a little Shirley Temple, Little Miss Marker. This is, I've never seen this, 1934, uh, directed by Alexander Hall. 
in one of her earliest and most popular roles, the adorable Shirley Temple, single-handedly melts the hearts of a gang of hardened gamblers when she's left as an IOU or a marker for a debt. All right, we have an audio commentary by Lee Gambin with uh, costume historian Alyssa Rose. They do good work together. That's good stuff. All right, let me grab another handful. Oh, this is this is good. If I had a million, if I had a million dollars, am I, am I, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. Some algorithm on YouTube, like a red warning light just went off. It was like copyrighted material. That's the alarm. Uh, Gary Cooper, Charles Lawton, W.C. Fields, George Raft. Man, that's a cast. 1932 pre-code, right. Um, let's see. Oh, here's another Daniel, uh, Alan Arkish with Daniel Kramer. To prevent his inheritance from going to his greedy family, a dying steel tycoon chooses eight random strangers and give the, gives them each one million bucks. Among those are among those chosen are an entertainer, W.C. Fields, my little chickadee, who uses the money to clear bad drivers from the road, a marine, Gary Cooper, who believes the check uh, is an April Fool's Day prank, and an office clerk, Charles Lawton, who finally sees an opportunity to quit his job. Um, this sounds fun. And it's going to be, it's 88 minutes. So the thing I love about these pre-code movies that aren't directed by Cecil B. DeMille is that they're like, you know, they're really short. Uh, Alan Ladd, Lucky Jordan. This, I love, I have really, in the last couple of years, knowing Alan Ladd, especially from his Western work, and then discovering all of the stuff from the 30s and the 40s, it was really the 40s, um, and like the whole other career that he had prior to Westerns, and like, the influence on Indiana Jones and like Spielberg and Lucas and all those guys. Uh, so this is 1942, 84 minutes, brand new HD master from a 2K scan of the 35 millimeter fine grain audio commentary by film historian, Sam Deegan. Um, uh, good stuff. Really good. That's, that's great. Uh, we got, we got Bob, Bob Hope in the house. And it's a Martha Ray and Bob Hope never say die. Yeah. Uh, brand new HD master. These impressions are lost on anybody that doesn't know what Bob Hope sounds like, or like that was his gimmick. Cause he was, he was always talking like this, you know. And like, hey, hey, what do you, what do you say? Report me some of the. Is it, my favorite line is uh, in uh, the. Is it um, uh, the cat and the canary? Is it the cat and the canary? Is it the ghost breakers? I think it's the cat and the canary. It's the one where they go to the old house, the old dark house, and she's like, the spirits are all around you, and he's like, what do you, what do you say? We pour them in a glass with some ice, sure. So it's like those jokes stay funny to me. Some of those are vaudeville jokes, is what they are. Uh, brand new HD master from a 2K scan of 35 millimeter fine grain. This is a universal picture. 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 Universal. All these are universal. I love like this is really like universal is getting it out. I love that the universal archive is being tapped like a tree in Canada. With a, like a maple tree, so the syrup can fly. I don't know. I was going on with a weird metaphor there. I love that Universal is allowing that vault to be tapped, so all these titles can get out there. Because what are the odds we're going to get something like this? A 1939 movie, um, audio commentary by film historians Paul Anthony Nelson and Lee Zachariah, and a theatrical trailer. Uh, a 2K scan, man. That's like what a what, what a world where we're getting 2K scans of these 30s movies. 1938. Uh, thanks for the memory. That's another Bob Hope and Shirley Ross. It's just interesting too. Is like so often you get Bob Hope and then the co-star, the the female lead changes from movie to movie. But um, and sometimes they come back. Sometimes they do more than one. All right. So this is uh, 1938, 75 minutes. We got audio commentary by Michael Schlesinger, and uh, oh, it doesn't say anything about being newly restored here. But. <gasps> With Joel McRae and Yvonne DiCarlo. I tell you what, Yvonne DiCarlo has become like one of my favorite stars of all time. Lily Monster from the Monsters, if you're not familiar, Yvonne DiCarlo. And it's so funny because like my entire generation grew up watching the Monsters and was not particularly aware of her prior star. She's in the Ten Commandments and stuff. Like she's out there. It's not like nobody knew. But like my generation knew her as this one thing. Like the horror generation knew her as one thing. And she even did horror movies. Is she in Cellar Dweller? What's the movie she's in from the, the 80s? Um, but one of the most glamorous movie stars of that era. Just a gorgeous, wonderful... I like. I crush hard on Yvonne DiCarlo. And so every time we get another Yvonne DiCarlo movie, I'm just like, ah, 
Yes. So, okay, so this is a 1954 movie. Uh, you know, I love Westerns. I've never seen this one, so I'm excited about this. Uh, Joel McRae, too. Like, he's one of the, like, the Mount Rushmore of Western actors from this. The, the, like, everybody who's in the, like, 20s, 30s, they're like, hey, you son of a, like, I just threw a grenade somewhere. But, like, Joel McRae for the talking era, like, he's a huge Western star. Um Joel McRae and the dazzling Yvonne DiCarlo, you got that right, Jack, have a date with destiny in this powder keg of the West beyond the border river. Desperately hoping to turn the tide of the Civil War, Confederate soldier Cleef, uh, no, sorry, Cleet Matson steals $2 million in gold bars for the, and from the Union and heads for the Mexico border town of Zona Libre, where he hopes to buy munitions and supplies with Yankee troops in hot pursuit. Cleet soon discovers he might be in worse situations, a worse situation with a greedy despot. Uh, crooked businessman and other shady characters. We're, we're not talking about Yvonne DiCarlo in this. Directed by action adventure ace George Sherman and Glorious Technicolor. Guess what? It's 1954. It's Glorious Technicolor, but it's 80 minutes long. This is what I love about these movies. You got like full character development. You got like three act structure. 80 minutes. You bang that. You you program. That's why they call these movies programmers sometimes. Is because you can program. You know, program like a night at the movies. You can watch two, three movies, shorts, whatever, and you're still only out like three hours or four hours or whatever. And uh, that's that's one of the things that I love about Westerns is like there's an economy. Man, here's another one. Van Heflin and Yvonne DiCarlo in Tomahawk. Uh, Lee Gambin is doing film audio commentary by Lee Gambin, an actress, film historian, Rutanya Alda. He told us this was coming in his uh, when I interviewed him. This is like a couple of months ago now, I guess. But he told us this was coming. Uh, this is another George Sherman film, uh, Tomahawk. Um, let's see. What else do we want to talk about? 1951, 82 minutes. Look how... Look at that movie star, Yvonne DiCarlo. <laughs> and there's a whole history there, too. Like, if you want to, like... Her, you know, I'm not even going to go... If you want to... Like, there, she wrote a book... And the book's been out of print for years, and it's it goes for like a hundred dollars. I don't have it because I'm not willing to pay that for a used, a used book. But like, if we could get that book back in print, or even an ebook, somebody get this thing in ebook form. Uh, I would love to know what she had to say about her career. Uh, John Barrymore, counselor at law. This is uh, William Wyler, the great William Wyler, uh, with um, a uh, this pre code 1933. New 2K Master? Where, hell, were these new? No, no new masters there. New 2K Master, um, uh, directed by the illustrious William Wyler, The Good Fairy, Detective Story, The Big Country, Ben Hur. Um, briskly paced counselor at law is often cited as the best film ever to tackle the intricacies and pitfalls of the legal profession. All right, so we've got uh, audio commentary by Daniel Kramer and Catherine Wyler. And it is a 1933 movie that runs 82 minutes. This is what I'm talking about, guys. Are we out? Uh, hold on. Everything else here is uh, not a studio classic. So we can transition now into other, other things. So let's see. The Man Without a World. This is from Kino Lorber and Associated with Milestone Film and Video. If Charlie Chaplin set city lights in this shtetl, it would look like the man without a world. Uh, both funny and sensual. Visionary. What is this? This is a 1991 movie. 1991. New 4K restoration. With a new score. Silent. Is it a silent movie from 1991? The Man Without a World is a bold, independent American film. See, this is what you would never see if I had done if I hadn't done what I'm doing in this video, where I'm like, let's see them together for the first time. Um, this conceptual masterpiece of an important artist, a meditation on history, a very funny and beautiful melodrama credited. Oh, hold on. Credited to the legendary and imaginary 1920s Soviet director, Yevgeny, Yevgeny Antonov. The film was actually made by Eleanor Anton, Eleanor Anton in 1991. So it's a mock silent film. They've also got two other historical conjuring acts from Eleanor Anton from the archives of modern art and uh, The Last Night of Rasputin. So they're pretend, they're, they're homage is the silent film, but they're actually made in the 90s, the 80s and the 90s. So that's, that's interesting. Maybe this would be a good double feature 
with the uh, avant-garde of silent cinema. This is huge, you guys. I'm super excited about this. Uh, the Lena, Wirt, Lena Wirt Miller and Piero Cristofani Raro video are... Raro? I hear people pronounce this differently. Raro? I think Frank Tarzi pronounced it Raro. Um, it's Italian, so there, there you go. Then it's the Bell Star Story. Elsa Martinelli in the Bell Star Story. So it's Euro Western, Spaghetti Western. Um, it's... Get, what, hold on. What, we got an audio commentary by Sam Deegan. Uh, 1968. I was looking for restoration notes. I don't see any of those here. But anyway, this is exciting because I love my Spaghetti Westerns. Somebody asked me the other day, could I do a rundown of all the Spaghetti Westerns on Blu-ray and what Spaghetti Westerns might be coming out on Blu-ray? And like, I wish I could. That's a monumental task, especially when we're getting Spaghetti Westerns like on the regular now, uh, several a month now. So that's, it's a hard task. Um, the Wildcat, this is from the Ernst Lubitsch, Lubitsch collection. Uh, what year is this? This is 19. Ernst Lubitsch is recognized as the director of some of Hollywood's greatest comedies, including Trouble in Paradise from 1932 and Ninotchka in 1939. However, he made some of his best films while an emerging filmmaker in his native Germany. The Wildcat is a madcap farce about a charming lieutenant who is captured en route by outlaws who roam the snow-covered mountains. But what is the year is what I'm looking for. I don't see it here. It says that it's a 2000 restoration. Uh, it also features... Oh, here. The blue box has got additional... Uh, 1960, a 37-minute short, or that's not a short, it's a short film, I guess. When I Was Dead, a.k.a. Where Is My Treasure, from 1916, directed and starring Ernst Lubitsch, and an audio commentary on that, When I Was Dead, by Joseph McBride, who wrote the book about Ernst Lubitsch. Um, interesting stuff. Inter Does this have any alternate? No. All right. Grabbing a fistful here. Polinegri. Polinegri. Polinegri, more Ernst Lubitsch. Um, this is um, originally released under the title One Arabian Night. Sumeroon was among Lubitsch's early triumphs and helped secure his invitation to Hollywood. This exotic spectacle stars, nope, uh, as Sumeroon, a rebellious member of a harem who has committed the greatest of sins. She has rejected the old sheik and fallen in love with the charming cloth merchant. So this is, again, I'm not seeing an original year. Oh, 1920. Um, and it has a screen test. It's got a screen test, you guys. Screen test footage for Lubitsch's unrealized American production of Marguerite and Faust in, from 1923 for the Mary Pickford Company. If you pay attention to the Mary Pickford Company, they are cranking it out. They are doing so much. They are working with Flickr Alley. They're working with uh, VCI. They're working with, uh, with um, Kino Lorber. They're really doing a lot of stuff to... Uh, to preserve these classics that are like a hundred years old. And that's really good because without restoration and preservation, they just disintegrate to nothing. Uh, this is another Kino Classics, Asphalt. Let's see. From its elaborate, stylish opening scene, Asphalt immediately established itself as a startling cinematic achievement of Weimar cinema. Uh, what year is this? This is 1929, German. Audio commentary by film historian Anthony Slide. 5.1 surround. Do we need a 5.1? Well, I mean, it's probably got new new audio, so I understand. Whole, uh, you saw that was about to jump pretty far on my jump to conclusions, Matt. Um, I was like, wait a minute. This is a revisionist. No. 5.1 and then lost those 2.0 audio. Um, interesting stuff. Well, guys, let me know out there, like, who's... I, would, I know we have film students that watch these videos. Uh, feel like film school students. Um, let's talk about, we always talk about the studio classics because you see how excited I get about them. That's really my sweet spot. Let's talk about some of this other stuff if you're interested in it. And I would like to know who's connecting with this and like, you know, uh, it's an opportunity for me to learn, frankly, you know, get out of my comfort zone. Um, here's season four. This should be the end of the road, I believe, of, of Maigret. 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 These are little Britain fans out there. Maigret. Maigret. There's a man here who says he wants the fourth season of Margaret. Uh, all right. So this has a uh, bonus feature. So it's got a play of the month from 1969, 92 minutes. Margaret at bay. 
the state of Megray restoration notes. That's what I like. We talked about this with the first, re- the first season release of these is that they're very transparent about like, it was in kind of bad shape. It had combing. And so we did this to it. I like that. So many of these restorations, you get them and you're like, well, what, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? I always like, re- cause we, like, well, I'm just going to say, like Warner Brothers, they never tell you where the restorations come from. You don't know the source elements. You don't know if it's original camera negative. You don't know if it's like a fine grain. You don't, you don't know anything. And I like knowing. Uh, all right. This is uh, Kenny Lorber in association with Greenwich. This is uh, I Got a Monster based on the best selling book. One of the most startling police corruption scandals in a generation. Oh, man. That's a DVD. Here's a DVD as well. The Super 8 Years, a film by Annie Ernau and David Ernau Brio. Uh, gorgeously intellect- and intellectually expansive film, a worthy addition to an oeuvre of one of Europe's greatest living authors. The French writer and 2022 Nobel Prize awardee Annie Ernau, whose novels and memoirs have gained her a devoted following, uh, opens a treasure trove with this delicate journey into her family's memory, compiled from gorgeously textured home movie images from 1972 to 1981 when her books were first published. Her sons became teenagers. Her husband, Philip, uh, brought an 8mm film camera everywhere they went. as a portion of a time, a place, the moment of personal and political significance. Interesting. Ooh, burlesque. Oh, man. Uh, burlesque, Heart of the Glitter Tribe, a funny, sexy, intimate look at the hardworking soul of Neo Burlesque. Um, this is uh, 2018. Kino in association with Virgil Films. It's a documentary. Sorry, there's the glare. Let me get fighting that glare. Okay. And this is going to be oh, the last handful here. Dear Mr. Brody. Uh, a poignant investigation of universal dreams. This is a Telluride Film Festival entry, South by Southwest 2021, Tribeca Film Festival. Hold on, pop culture. Let's see. When 21 year old hippie millionaire Michael Brody Jr. decided to give away his fortune to anyone in need, he ignited a psychedelic spiral of events. An instant celebrity, Brody was mobbed by the public, scrutinized by the press, and overwhelmed by the crush of personal letters responding to his extraordinary offer. 50 years later, an enormous cachet of these letters are discovered unopened. Ooh, this sounds really good. Uh, pop culture charged lightning in a bottle has been incisively captured in Keith Maitland's film, says the Los Angeles Times. Entertainment Weekly says a far out cautionary tale of money, media, and gonzo idealism gone wrong. These documentaries, I love these documentaries that tell us like, because I'm like a history student and I love the psychedelic movement, you know, like I, they, um, it was a, November, maybe it was a, a few months back. Keanu Lorber released a documentary about the automat that I talked about it before. I talked about it a few times, but like Mel Brooks was heavily involved because he was like, Oh, the automat, you put the nickel in the thing and it would give you the coffee with the perfect amount of cream. And like he's walking in the, down the, his memories of the automat. And like I knew I would enjoy it, but like I loved it. I was like, This is amazing. So this sounds really, really good too. Uh, Here's a TV show, Paris Police 1900. It's DVD. Uh, is this French murder blackmail conspiracies? Welcome to La Belle Epoque. Let's see. Paris 19, oh, sorry, Paris 1899. The French president has just died. It's, all right. I'm not going to read all of this to you. I'll hold it up so you can check it out in a second. But uh, this is how many episodes? It's a three disc set, 438 minutes. I wish it was Blu ray, but. Uh, any, you know, people watch this from all over the world. Has anyone seen this? Is this show as cool as it sounds? We're living in a golden age of TV right now because we're also, like in America, we have all these TV shows, but also everywhere else. You know, there's like Gamora and uh, Rocco Schivone is incredible. I mean, it's incredible. Um, all right, we have two left. They are both from Cohen Media Group. I'll go with this one first. Secret Defense. Um, this is a... 1997 drama directed by Jacques Rivette. Um, a thriller of the mind, beautifully made, emotionally powerful, says the Daily Telegraph. 
Pure class, a superior crime thriller, says uncut, and clearly the work of a master, says empire. A bonus commentary with a, uh, audio commentary by director emeritus, New York Film Festival, and professor of film and media studies, Columbia University, Richard Pena, and the re-release trailer. And last, but most certainly probably not least, is Let It Be Morning, which is a... Looking for the year. Is this 2019? Uh, Israel's official submission for Best International Film uh, Feature Film at the 94th Academy Awards and an official selection of the 20, 2021 Cannes Film Festival. Uh, no extras on this. There's the back of the box. All right, we covered a lot of ground here. What would what are you picking up? What are you hoping to grab in the next in your next order? Um, I think for me, it's safe to say I'll be starting with Yvonne DiCarlo. And maybe the Bob Hopes after that, because those are always fun. Bob Hope movies go down like, like honey. <laughs> I don't know. It's good. Honey with a little bit of ginger, a touch of ginseng on an ice cube. I don't know. Guys, thank you so much. Thanks to Kino Lorber for sending this stuff over for me to share with you. Uh, I think that Serial at Midnight is one of your only uh, monthly full resources for everything that Kino Lorber is putting out. I should also say, there's a few things that aren't here in this hall either. I don't know if they were delayed, the warehouse things we were talking about. So we'll cover them if they show up between now and the next video. Uh, at some point, we'll talk about, them, talk about them again. But thank you guys. I appreciate you. Take care. Till next time, I will catch you later.